Evolution is an unproven theory. It, what its fundamentalist supporters believe is true, fishes decided to grow lungs and legs and walk up on the beach. This idea is so comically daft that only one thing's explained its survival. Now why do people keep holding to this? That lonely, frightened people want to expel God from the universe because they found the idea that He exists profoundly uncomfortable. Welcome to Go Ye Into All the World. I'm Pastor Scott Ingram, and I'd like to welcome you to this video message today. Today, I'm going to be discussing Genesis 1-1, and uh, it's one of the most highly uh, contested uh, passages in the Bible, the very first chapter. Imagine that. It would seem that many uh, atheists and skeptics have decided that we have a weak foundation with the Word of God. The very first 11 chapters, you know, uh, they are just ridiculous. There's no way there could have been a worldwide flood or there could have been uh, God creating the earth just by speaking and all these different things. But I think you're going to understand from this episode today that science, real science, actually backs up the truths of Scripture more than it backs up some of the nonsense that you hear today. I pray you'll listen closely to today's message, and uh, let's go ahead and get into it. I'm only going to preach on one verse, so it'll only be a two-hour sermon today. Um, but it's one verse. It's Genesis 1-1, very first verse in the Bible. It says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. When I was a kid back in the 1980s, there was a, uh, a particular film that I enjoyed watching. And it was about this kid who was attacked by bullies. He was attacked by this group of bullies who knew karate. They were in this karate dojo. And they would get this one little kid and they, they beat this guy up. Uh, but the kid decides he's going to learn karate and he goes to this uh, rather interesting older man who teaches him how to use karate. And he goes in, and at the end of the, the program of this movie, um, he is there, and he has hurt his leg. And it looks like this leg is, is what's going to cause him to lose the match against all these bullies. He's got, he's got all the way through this, and it looks like if, if, he, if he loses his foundation, he's going to fall. Well, the villain turns out to be more so in this movie, not the bullies, but the guy who was teaching all of them in this karate dojo. And so he tells them, go and sweep the leg. Some of y'all know what movie I'm talking about, don't you? He tells them to sweep the leg. And, and you know, the guy's like, you want me to do that? Yeah, yeah, sweep the leg. Why does he tell him to sweep the leg? Because he believes that if you take out the foundation of a fighter, that he's going to fall, right? What I have just read to you, what occurs from Genesis chapter 1 all the way to chapter 11, there are a lot of people in the world today, they think that that is our weak spot. They think that if we can just knock out Genesis 1 through 11, all the rest of it's going to fall. They think that it's weak. But folks, there is such truth in here that goes along with the scientific knowledge that we see around us right now. There is more, it takes more to believe in the insanity of evolution than it takes to believe what Genesis 1 through 11 says. Even though it is outlawed, you hear me? It is outlawed to be taught in our school system that there was a great flood, that there was a creator, that there was a cause that started all these things up. You're not allowed to say that. And so, there, a lot of people think today that there's this conflict between that science and religion, between Christianity and uh, reality. Folks, there is no conflict. It, it's very clear this has to occur this way. There was a man in 1820. His name was Hubert Spencer. And Hubert Spencer said there are five things to, in order to uh, explain the unknown. Five things that really all of reality is made up of. You have to go to these five things to figure out 
anything. It, it all falls in these five different categories. And the five different categories that he gave were time, force, energy, space, and matter. And you know that Moses, writing down the Scripture under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, here in Genesis 1-1, he gives us each one of those in that first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, time, God, the, uh, the force, created energy, the heaven, space, and the earth, matter. All five right there from the very first verse of the Bible. I want us to take a look at that today to give us an idea to understand that if, if this is true, if God created you, then He has some authority over what you do, doesn't He? He has some authority in saying what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's not. He has a right to tell you when you're wrong and what you're doing because you are His, right? You are not your own. Look here at the end of the beginning. Time. The evolutionist, he is always is adding to the length of the universe. Do you know what the present uh, number they say that our universe, the age it is? They say today that it is 13.8 billion years old. Now why do they need it to be so old? Why do they need to go back billions and then a few years later, well, let's give or take two or three trillion. We'll just, you know. Why do they keep adding on to this time? Because they believe that it will make sense what they are preaching with evolution if they add time to it. The more time that you have, the more chance you have that evolution will occur. Now, folks, I want to make some clear definitions of what I'm talking about today. Evolution, many people think of it, well, that means they turn into a monkey. No, that's not exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about, they say, that there are these changes that occur over time in different species that make them into other species. There's one called microevolution. Now, microevolution, you can go into a scientific lab and you can look at microevolution. You can see uh, different little changes. For example, you put certain animals down in a dark place for so long, their eyes will go away, right? That's a sign of microevolution. You can see uh, different animals. They'll be in certain types of, of climate. They'll go up and, and they'll begin to take on some of the colors, some of those animals will, of the different creatures there. That is something called microevolution. What's micro? Little, right? And uh, well, what they're teaching us is something called macroevolution. And let me tell you, it's about as dumb as macaroni is what it is. <laughs> macroevolution. It's huge evolution. It's to say that a fish is going to turn into a lady. It's to say that a rock just one day turned into a fish. It's to say, and this has been told many times, that a dinosaur. You know, if I could see Jurassic Park, at the end, they look up at the birds flying up in the sky and they think, wow, that's, that's what the dinosaurs all become. And that ain't a fairy tale, right? That ain't a fairy tale that a giant lizard turned into a bird just one day. But if you give it enough time, they say, all these things can occur. How do they get the number that they get? Well, according to space.com, they say the universe cannot be younger than the objects contained inside of it. By determining the ages of the oldest stars, science are able to put a limit on the age. Notice their assumption. Assumption. Their assumption is that everything has always went the same all the way throughout time. Now, folks, you all have lived in this area for a while. Has everything always been the same in the little few years that you've been here on this earth? Does nothing ever change around you? Now, remember, the word evolution literally means change, and yet they're claiming that there hasn't been any change all this time, and they can get an accurate uh, time meter to show exactly how long this period of time has occurred. Now, the Bible actually tells us that there will be people in the last days who will fall for this foolishness, just like you see around you. In 2 Peter chapter 3, Verses 3 through 5, it says there shall come in the last days scoffers. That's people who mock about things. Walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of His coming? 
For since the fathers fell asleep, the people who lived before us died off, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. They believe that there's just been this steady thing. But what did God do when He created it? You know, if you read out the rest of Genesis 1, what actually was occurring there? Did God create a, uh, a little tiny baby Adam? You ever hear the old story about the chicken and the egg? Which come first? I know God said it was the chicken. Yes. Right? And it was a grown man called Adam. And it was a grown universe already created, fully grown, all around us. And that's exactly what we see here. So if I take my measurements and I begin to measure, and I don't count in for the fact that God created a full grown universe, I'm going to get a wrong number, aren't I? Right? Am I not going to get a wrong number? My timing will be incorrect. God said that He created a full grown universe. He doesn't only say it in Genesis. He says it in Isaiah as well. In Isaiah chapter 48 verse 13, He says, Mine hand also hath laid the foundation of the earth. Isaiah is a liar if Genesis 1 isn't true. You see how you can't just cut the first 11 chapters out? It goes throughout the whole Bible. Mine hand, he says, also hath laid the foundation of the earth. God speak here. And my right hand has spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. How did you do it, God? I called and they came and they were there. That's a mighty God, isn't it? That's a mighty God that we serve. There was no gradual evolution of the stars and the galaxies all around us and the solar planets. No, they all stood up together. Everything came together at once when God spoke it to be so. And He did all these things in a six-day period. Every time He spoke, the command action immediately followed. Genesis 1.11 shows us this. God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit, and it was so. Wouldn't you like to grow grass like that in your front yard? We had a hard time growing grass in our front yard. We, we laid out the straw and all that stuff, and the wind come blew all the straw away, and I paid about, about $100 or so, probably more than that. Misty knows better than I do about the money. Uh, but we had so much money in there for all that straw, and it just blew away, and all that seed went away. I like to be like God. Bring forth, and it was so, right? But I ain't God, am I? I'm just one of His created beings. He said, bring forth and it was so. And in Adam, I was there. And it was all the way down to me. God had it all together. Oh, he's an awesome God, folks. He's an awesome God. He's a God that can be trusted. Time began and God did it in six days to give us a pattern. Now, isn't that interesting? Every culture in the world has a seven-day week. Wonder where they all got that from. Gee, did they take notes as they were becoming eight men? Did they take notes and say, well, over here we might ought to have a seven day week too? Right? I'm thinking that there was a great creation that occurred over a six day period and God rested on the seventh day. And man took that from the Tower of Babel that you'll see in Genesis 11, all out to the ends of the earth, knowing that there was a seven day period to occur. Don't let them tell you they're sweeping your leg. The foundation is sure and strong, folks. The foundation is sure. And not only will time have a beginning, the book tells us that time will have an end. If you go all the way to Revelation 10, 6, he's still preaching that God created the heavens and the earth to people. Still showing them the truth that He did this. You didn't just come out of nothing. You have a purpose and a plan for life. In Revelation 10, 6, there is an angel flying over the heavens while all this chaos is going on earth. And he declares that there's coming this day. It's not too far off now from the time he's saying it that there'll be an end to time. He says in Revelation 10, 6, He sweared by Him that liveth forever and ever. That's God. He is eternal. Who created heaven and the things that are in our and the earth and the things that there in are and the sea and the things which are therein. And then he says that there should be time no longer. The eternal one who started all this off is now declaring that time is going to end. It's going to end. Isn't it funny? He has to preach to us over and over again. I'm your creator. It's kind of like when, you, when your kids are. I'm your daddy. You listen to what I say, right? In the beginning time, God, this is the force. 
Scientific law. Now, there's a difference between a scientific law and a scientific theory. A theory is something that's working its way into a law. When the scientists say this is law, that means there's just absolutely no doubt about it. There ain't nobody that is arguing against this. This is a scientific law. And that scientific law says for every cause there must also be an effect. For every cause, there must also be an effect. So when I was studying in my biology book in college and I was looking through there and I was looking, well, what did they say caused all this? What started all this? We don't know. Big letters. We don't know. But believe us when we say you were a fish. Believe us when you evolved monkey ape. Believe us when I say you came from a rock. But we don't know how it all got started. But we're working on it. Now they say that it's eternal, that the earth, the universe is eternal, that it's always been here. Folks, ever since you've been here, things have been corroding and going downhill. It's obvious that this had a start. It's going downhill, isn't it? The things around us are corroding, they're going downhill. And so we see that. You must first have a cause, and that cause cannot have been a cause that had a beginning itself. What I say, the, re the revelation there, he said that this is the one who liveth forever and ever. He is eternal. He started it. He is the first cause that started everything around us. What do the evolutionists describe as how all this came? They describe a tree of life. While the Christian and the I'd say somebody with common sense when they look outside, say that the, we come from different kinds. Just like Genesis 1 says. He says that He created one kind of dogs, one kind of fish, one kind of animal. Now these, inside these kinds there have been changes. There have been those microevolutionary changes, right? We have different species of dogs. We have different uh, types of cats. All the out of that one cat kind or that one dog kind. That's what you see when you stay around. You don't see a dog and a monkey coming together and creating a dog monkey, right? Because they are two different kinds. That's common sense, isn't it? Isn't that common sense? You don't see that occurring, but they say that you literally came from a rock and it grew out from a rock into an amoeba, into a fish, into a person, into a, no, I'm sorry, I forgot the monkey person, and then on out to a person. This is what they say. But is that what you see in nature itself? Do you see cows giving birth to chimpanzees? Some of y'all work on a farm, don't you? You ever see a cow give birth to a chimpanzee? You ever see any of these things occur? No! It's ridiculous, right? It's ridiculous. This is the exact words of Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, he's an atheist. He's an evolutionist. He thinks he's the smartest man on the earth. That these are his words. The atoms of our bodies are traceable to stars that manufactured them in their cores and exploded these enriched ingredients across our galaxy billions of years ago. Now, he wasn't there. He don't know what happened. For this reason, we are biologically connected to every other living thing in the world. We are chemically connected to all molecules on earth. And we are atomically connected to all atoms in the universe. We are not figuratively, but literally stardust. <laughs> Go ahead and laugh. It's funny, isn't it? It is. I just told a joke right there. He's saying that a rock gave birth to a man. That's how stupid that idea of evolution is. He's saying that a rock gave birth. Perhaps all the atoms that we see are there because we all have a common creator. Have you ever seen a Van Gogh painting? Have you ever seen a Vincent Van Gogh? You can tell the difference, can't you? There's a difference in certain types of painting because you can know that the creator's hand has put that painting together. You can see the difference. For example, when you write your name, down at Walmart, you buy that piece of gum. They don't actually look as closely now, but your signature has a certain picture to it. God's signature is on each one of us sitting here today. God's signature is in the wood that He created to put this pulpit together. God's signature is in the, the plastic that was used here that was put together. God's signature is on everything around us that He has placed together. And so maybe that is what we should look for and not this idea of I came from a rock. Rocks didn't just decide to become people over time. Fish didn't grow legs. Dinosaurs didn't become birds. Darwin said, this Charles Darwin is the man who first really pushed this forward in his book called The Origin of the Species about this idea of evolution. 
He said, I am certain that the fossil record will eventually show all these transitional forms where people are changing and fish are changing and all these different things are occurring. He says, you'll see it. And that was back in the 1800s. And you know what they found so far? They found animal bones. They found people bones. And they tried their best to put something together to make some kind of an excuse about it. Folks, you don't see any of it in there. This is a, a quote from a man named Peter Hitchens. Peter Hitchens. He used to be a profound atheist. He was brother of a man named Christopher Hitchens. And he says this. He said the BBC, that's the TV station over in England. He said the BBC teased religious leaders by asking them if they believed in the literal truth of the great Bible stories. They tried to mock them by asking them if they believed in what the Bible said. He said, I would like to ask the BBC chiefs and the rest of the secular establishment if they believe in the literal truth of evolution. Evolution is an unproven theory. If what its fundamentalist supporters believe is true, fishes decided to grow lungs and legs and walk up on the beach. This idea is so comically daft that only one thing's explained its survival. Now why do people keep holding to this? That lonely, frightened people want to expel God from the universe because they found the idea that He exists profoundly uncomfortable. Profoundly uncomfortable. Because what did I say? If you have a Creator, then you're accountable, right? In the beginning time, God, the force, created energy. How did He create the world? The Bible uh, has been known as, as I said is ex nihilo, out of nothing. God created everything out of nothing. And Jesus did this as well, didn't He? You know, this creative act is only uh, something God can do. Jesus, when He was handing out bread and fish, what happened? He created bread. He created fish to eat. He was God. He is God. He created those things right then and there. Only God has this creative power and only He can create when He wants to create. And that was the energy that he used then. In the beginning time, God, force, created energy, the heaven, space. An old movie used to say, in space, no one can hear you scream. You ever heard of that? The reason no one can hear you scream is because there's no air in space. It's a vacuum. Sound waves can't travel through a vacuum. And outer space begins around 100 kilometers above the earth where the shell of the earth around our planet disappears with no air to scatter the sunlight and produce a blue sky. Space appears as a, blank, a, black blanket, a black blanket dotted with stars. You know what science told people back around the time of Jesus? They said that the earth was flat. Flat as a flitter. And they said Apollos carried it around on his back. That's what the greatest scientists of the day were, were saying. And people believed that. People believed what they were saying back then. But it's the oldest book in the Bible, it isn't Genesis, it's actually Job. From what I understand, many people believe it to be Job. The inspired writer there in one verse reveals two scientific principles that weren't known to man until much later. In Job 26, 7, it says, He stretches out the north over the empty space and hangeth the earth upon nothing. Now remember, they think it's a flat earth. They think Apollos is holding it up. There's a place in the North Star, scientists now know, or in the North, where no stars exist, which cannot be seen with the naked eye. How did the writer of Job know that? Well, I know how he knew that, don't you? Also, that same verse declares that God hangs the earth on nothing, right? We know this is true now, but we've only known it for about 350 years when God's inspired writer told us over 3,000 years ago that the earth is held in place by gravitational forces. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome to know that God had all those things in place? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You see, this is why we don't see the next thing. Because we can't get past the physical world. God created matter, and for some reason we're stuck on that idea. We don't believe that there's a soul. There's a, I, I remember studying in college, and I would watch videos that I didn't have to watch just so I could understand the things they were telling me over here. And I picked up this thing on iTunes Education, and I was watching it, and this was a, a professor in Princeton. And he was saying that a man doesn't have a soul. And he was making all these different ideas about why a man doesn't have a soul. And I was thinking to myself, he was teaching psychology, and the literal word psychology comes from a study of the soul. 
Professing to be wise, we become fools. You hear me? Professing to be wise, we become fools. Matter, God created all the things that we see, but He also created the inward things. And that's modern science problem. It doesn't only recognize that. It doesn't recognize the body, the soul, and the spirit. And Proverbs 1, 7 tells us that if you don't begin with the fear of the Lord, you have no wisdom. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. One day, God's wrath is going to be revealed to all the people who haven't trusted in His book, who haven't trusted in what His Word says about His Son who came to die for our sins upon that cross. His Son being God Himself who could speak things into existence while He was here. That same God, Romans 1.18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. I really don't believe somebody's so foolish to think they come from a rock. I don't care how many PhDs you got. I really don't believe that. I don't believe somebody's that foolish that they think that. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has showed it in them. He says He showed it to you in your clear view. All of these things have a common design. God created this world for the invisible things, He says. What are those invisible things? That soul and spirit they deny? Of Him from the creation of the world. My, that's a common topic in Scripture, isn't it? Are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so they were without excuse. Why are they without excuse? Because they knew this to be so. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but become vain, arrogant in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. How foolish it is not to give glory to God. The leg hasn't been swiped, people. The leg hasn't been swiped, just like in that old movie, and I ain't going to do that. He kicks him backwards, doesn't he? He gives him the drop kick at the end, doesn't he? And we can do that to these people who try to push this nonsense on us, this ignorance on us that tells us that God did not create the heavens and the earth. Well, as you can see today, the leg hasn't been swiped. The foundations of Christianity are strong, and the foundations of the Word of God are strong as well. They're backed up what we can see within the world. Um, Folks, don't let the first 11 chapters of Genesis keep you from going deeper and understanding that Jesus did come to this world. He did live a real life. He was God in human flesh. And when he came, he lived a perfect life and he paid the price for your sins on the cross. All of these things work themselves together throughout the entirety of Scripture. And, and uh, you can't cut one piece out and expect the rest to fit together. It's just not going to happen.